Welcome back to Freedom and Prosperity Radio. Matt Philbin from Newsbusters and the Media Research Center coming up. But first, I got a question for you. What would you think, you know, all great. Affectionate guy. I've known Joe Biden a long time, as have many others, and have always found him a very emotional man who is very, very affectionate. Yeah. I don't know. David Gergen getting affectionate with Joe Biden is just imagery I don't need on uh, this hour of a Wednesday morning. But uh, there it is. You know, I'm waiting for the Virginia politicians to start saying the same thing about uh, Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax. He's just a very affectionate guy. Um, as they circle the wagons, it is uh, believe the accuser as long as she's accusing a Republican. As soon as she uh, demeans, you know, say, the University of Virginia in Rolling Stone magazine uh, or a Joe Biden, uh, we will uh, mount a, a counteroffensive immediately uh, to you. And, and really, the only people who are taking the side of the young lady from the Southwest is that uh, is the people who might have to face off with Joe Biden for the nomination. That was just a little bit of our uh, media commentariat. And joining us now from the Media Research Center, Culture Division Newsbusters, Matt Philbin. Uh, Matt, good to hear from you, my friend. How are you doing this morning, sir? I'm doing excellent. Thanks for having me. Do you ever wake up? there at uh, the Media Research Center and Newsbusters and you and the Bozells. Did you ever sit there and say, I just don't think we can go any further. I don't think we can get any stranger. And then you <laughs> do, and then somebody does. And this whole Joe Biden arc so close to the uh, the Brett Kavanaugh story. It, 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 do they do they really think we don't pay this close attention, or are they counting on it just being you and me and and maybe a couple of the national conservative talk show hosts and the average American out there in uh, in flyover country when we take away your life? Electoral College are, aren't really paying attention. I think that's that's really what it is. They're, they they assume we're not paying attention, and the thing they can do is uh, next time they're accused of not doing their jobs, which will be tomorrow, um, <laughs> they can say, "Hey, look, we're on the case with Joe Biden. Uh, <laughs> we're but, on the case. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're on the case with tactile Joe Biden. But here's the problem." Um, Joe Biden is running against Democrats. He's a threat to fellow Democrats, mm-hmm, to fellow mm-hmm. liberals. Yep. Um, if you know, if that were not the case, they would circle the wagons around old Touchy Joe, and um, you know this wouldn't be an issue. Just like it wasn't an issue for the eight years of the Obama administration. Well, and and we all remember the you know powerful men have powerful needs. <laughs> uh, you know stories of the Clinton administration. It, let me ask you, now, we had invited Matt to come on um, as we have the big March for Life going on in Richmond today, uh, taking Governor Northam's true crime, not his yearbook picture, but the one that just just momentarily preceded it, where he admitted that as a pediatrician, he's a fan of infanticide. Um, and I'm sure the AMA is going to have words for him, but he's governor now. He doesn't need to be a doctor. Um, but they're going to march, and it uh, looks, looks like thousands of people are going to descend on the Virginia Capitol today in support of life, hard on the heels of unplanned, despite an absolute campaign to keep people from knowing about the movie, Matt, coming in as the number five highest grossing film in the nation. What, what does this tell you about the media and its power? I mean, we're still going to see a movie. Maybe the American people said to the media elites, we don't need you. We can spread the word ourselves. 
Well, I, I mean, I think it's, it certainly shows that there is a need. There is a, a, an unfilled need out there for, uh, for the other side, for the pro-life side, the pro, for the Christian side, for the uh, traditionalist side, whatever you want to call it. There is a need out there, and, it, and people, when people need something, the media will not get in the way, no matter how they've tried. And in this case, they have tried, uh, you know, heroically mm. to destroy this movie. Well, and, and the movie producers tried to buy commercial time, uh, and I cannot imagine... I mean, I've got ads for every Democrat candidate that wants to stick their name in front of my listeners, whether they think they're going to vote for them or not. Maybe they think one or two will. Um, but sometimes it, it, it's, you, you, there are laws that determine political ads I can't turn down. But why would a business that has to pay electric bills and make payroll and come up with health insurance, why would they turn down money from uh, – it, it, a, a, a sponsor who just wants to say, hey, come see this movie and make up your own mind? Uh, frankly, because it, the only actual answer to that, the only true answer, is that they are afraid possibly of the backlash from um, the abortion Uber Alice mm. wing of the Democratic Party, uh, from the activists. Mm -hmm. um, they tried to buy, the, the besides FNC, um, the movie or the producers tried to buy time on the Travel Channel, the Cooking Channel, HGTV, Food Network, mm. um, all these Discovery properties, um, and they would not uh, allow them to buy time. Um, they didn't want anything, quote-unquote, political. They didn't want to get into politics, um, which is, um, frankly... Uh, it's the worst cop out imaginable. Well, and um, it's a sad state of affairs when whether a baby lives or dies or a woman's struggle with her own mor moralities uh, becomes politics. I mean, it, to me, I, and I talked to Abby Johnson just a couple of weeks ago, the real one, and I, it, and it wasn't her decision wasn't based on hey, I'm a I'm a good Democrat, I better stay with this company. Her decision had zero to do with politics. Right. It it had everything to do with morality, with understanding what it was she was taking part in. Um, this is a really important subject, but the important thing about the uh, about the pro-abortion side of it is it relies on silence. It relies on subterfuge. It relies on on not on keeping people from knowing exactly what's going on, from mm -hmm. knowing what happens in an abortion, what happens in the kind of abortion or the kind of murder that Ralph Northam was talking about, oh, um, yeah. to, to face those things is, is really, uh, it, it's going to create far more pro-life people than it ever would uh, otherwise. Oh. To actually, you know, just as the ability to hear a baby's heartbeat uh, to see an ultrasound uh, makes makes more pro-life people than ever before. Uh, the more information that people have about this movie, about what this movie is about, and and frankly, other movies, um, you know, the Gosnell movie yeah, re no, a... had the same blocks put up in front of it. Hey, Matt. Um, uh, I'm, I got to run to a break here, and we're uh, talking about you know, the the media campaign against things like the unplanned movie uh, and its successes, despite all that. Matt Philbin with the Media Research Center. Can I hang on to you through the break? Sure. Visiting uh, with Matt Philbin from the Media Research Center about the 
uh, just absolute campaign to keep anyone from knowing about the movie Unplanned. You mentioned Gosnell, uh, Matt, before the break, um, and I, you know, I gave credit where credit's due. Our uh, Regal Cinemas here in Charlottesville, the Regal 14 out of Stonefield, uh, showed Gosnell without prompting, uh, showed Unplanned, had it on, has it still on one of its screens, showed uh, Dinesh D'Souza's Death of a Nation without uh, cajoling either. So, I mean, credit where credit do. I want to give credit to people who go out on that limb and just say, hey, it's a movie and people want to see it and I'm in the business of selling tickets to movies, uh, so why wouldn't I put it out there? Uh, what do you think the blowback is going to be? I've heard that uh, another 500 theaters have put Unplanned up on the screens. Uh, do you think uh, other news outlets might start carrying ads or, or even just TV networks or Twitter. I understand Twitter completely deplatformed it for a day. They, they, they took their Twitter handle down and you couldn't even tweet about unplanned. Um, uh, that's fixed. I guess it was a glitch according to Twitter. What, what do you make of all that? Yeah, well that's see, that's a, uh, an excellent example of what can happen when the word gets out. Um, with the day that uh, on March 30th, I guess is when the movie uh, debuted. Mm-hmm. Uh, all of a sudden, Twitter removed the account. Uh, the the movie, the unplanned account, was removed. Mm-hmm. It had about forty thousand followers. Mm-hmm. It was suspended without notice. Um, it, there was a public outcry. They brought the uh, they brought the account back. And all of a sudden, it had two hundred thousand followers, and it had gotten its blue check mark, which yeah. is how Twitter identifies a a verified account. Um, and then the blue check mark disappeared. So Twitter is kind of messing with um, with this account. But the important thing is how many more followers it gets mm-hmm. uh, when Twitter messes with the account. And I think you're you're I hope going to see the same thing in the larger media uh, with with the movie in general. Uh, they did. They added, uh, I guess it was 500 more screens. Um, it, uh, it was interesting because as of last week, I think it was Friday, Rotten Tomatoes had no, uh, had no reviews of it at all. Uh, then later in the day, they had reviews of it. Um, mm. The reviews were mixed. Um, oh yeah, uh, because you know it, it, they're going to be professional music, uh, professional movie reviewers, mm-hmm. um, of and and I don't doubt, by the way, that you know it may or may not be a great movie, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, there's there's a difference between whether it's a good movie and whether it's being uh, whether it's being repressed for. Mm-hmm political purposes right i mean but, look at look at all the people that told us about sharknado and sharknado <laughs> 2 um which was you know it, i i think almost intentionally god awful um yes. and, you know and and everyone had twitter feeds and retwitter feeds and youtube channels about and nobody got deplatformed over that so so it certainly can't be a mu uh, uh, an auteur's view of oh i don't like the you know i don't think it's a very good movie uh this is this is about the politics of the uh you know the the Planned Parenthood angle of this. Do they wield that kind of money? I don't see a lot of Planned Parenthood ads. How are they directing money into these folks' pockets? Because at the end of the day, I'd like to think that they're still commercial entities. Uh, they are still commercial entities, but you know the the, the abortion uh, uh, the abortion lobby and and that that entire sort of. Far left wing um, entity, you know that side of the Democratic Party. They they hold in enormous sway in our sectors of our elite uh, of our elites, uh, Hollywood. Um, you know, uh, mm. everybody in Hollywood is you know that it's it's a taboo to be pro life. Um, a lot of our corporate C suites 
um, you know, because they know where the money is. But, but you look know, at it, the numbers. The, I mean, the, 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 just in three months' time, the Knights of Columbus did two separate surveys, and there was a 16-point swing uh, in the American population's feeling on whether they were pro-life or pro, pro-choice. I mean, the media people of all, you know, we're shallow. We should be about the populace uh, and what they're believing. We should be almost, you know, mirrors of that. If we're all changing our opinion, aren't they in danger of irrelevancy? Well, they absolutely are, and I think you're seeing that. So some of the things you're seeing, um, the, the, the legislation in New York, the legislation in Virginia, um, you can make an argument that this is the last gasp of a very discredited and far uh, radical ideology um, that, is, that is doing its best to hang in there while the, the rest of America... Uh, essentially and sort of naturally aided by technology, aided by ultrasounds, aided by um, calm uh, information on the topic, is turning more and more Mm pro-life. I I agree with you on that, and I I hope from your lips to... You know, the, the to God's ears, you know, He sees it in us, uh, and I just, you know, and I swear that every time I talk about abortion, I want to bring up adoption. My niece is a an adopted uh, baby of a fourteen year old biological mother who, you know, unfortunately didn't understand what planning for parenthood meant, um, you know, and had and got herself into the position uh, of having a baby and did the right thing and found, you know, the gift to my sister in law and her husband of a of a baby that. That she couldn't raise, but oh, my sister-in-law had been trying for years. So, if nothing else, at least it gets us talking about uh, that aspect of it. Hey, thanks again, and again, newsbusters.org, and uh, you know, read all about it. Read all about it. We got to, you know, whether it's Axios or Drudge and Newsbusters, and you guys are at least, you know, putting the word out there. And and uh, is it fair as a punctuation mark, Matt, that despite it all? Unplanned was the fifth largest grossing movie in the nation. Oh, it's more than fair. I think it's uh, it's um, it, it's fitting and it's poetic and uh, and it's very heartening. Well, thank you for your time this morning. I appreciate it. We'll talk to you again very soon. Thanks. Great talking to you. Now, coming up next, we get a chance to sit down with exclusively the person who all of this is all about. We meet Abby Johnson herself next, coming up on this special edition of Freedom and Prosperity Radio, a presentation of the Virginia Institute for Public Policy that's at tertiumquids.org. Welcome back to this edition of Freedom and Prosperity Radio, the weekly radio program put together by the Virginia Institute for Public Policy. So much going on that we're trying to chop up and make it more easily digestible. And to help us do this is one of our favorite folks. We last saw him at CPAC a few, only a weeks ago. Hans von Spakovsky is the uh, manager of the Election Law Reform Initiative and senior fellow at the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, Hans, good to have you back on the program. How are you doing, sir? Uh, Joe, I'm doing great. Uh, should we mention that it's April Fool's Day uh, when we're speaking? <laughs> no, 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 no. That's all right. It's a, uh, you know, the, the, the Mueller report is not uh, an April Fool's gag. Uh, but no, I do... it's not. <laughs> So so let's let's jump in on the Mueller report and and right. again in typically fascinating style uh, our friends on the left can think somebody is the greatest hero and you know uh, the, the, he is every great law 
law enforcement officer. He's J. Edgar Hoover until he, they don't give them the results they want. And then he's corrupt and he's dirty and he's gambler and he's a drinker and, and a womanizer and everything. Well, no, hold on, that's Joe Biden. Uh, well, it's, but the point being is that they've turned on Mueller because he didn't give them the results they wanted. And then they go in and try to say, well, maybe he did. He didn't say he didn't do it. He just said they couldn't prove he did it. And they're trying to parse themselves. Uh, talk about what we've learned from the Mueller report, what we haven't learned, and what we should know better from the Mueller report. Well, the Mueller report was divided into two parts, one dealing with the collusion issue, second dealing with the obstruction of justice issue. And mm -hmm. the, the biggest thing to keep in mind about this is that there's no way that the critics of Mueller can somehow argue that he did not uh, have the time and the resources to oh. do the kind of investigation that needed to be done. Because one of the things that um, Attorney General Barr did in his summary letter that he sent over uh, to Congress was – he, he summarized the fact that um, there were almost 60 staffers in this investigation, 19 lawyers, 40 uh, additional FBI agents, intelligence analysts, uh, forensic accountants. And they not only interviewed 500 uh, potential witnesses, but they also served, I, I couldn't believe this, 2,800 subpoenas mm. for documents and information and executed 500 search warrants uh, also, in addition to other things like more than a dozen requests to foreign governments for evidence. So th this, was, this was a comprehensive, in-depth investigation that left no rocks uh, 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 overturned. Um, and so we know when he comes out and says in his report, there's no evidence of collusion, uh, there's no evidence of collusion. And that, that is uh, the final word on that. Uh, and, and again, Joe, we shouldn't be surprised by that because the media keeps forgetting or not mentioning the fact that, remember, both the House Intelligence Committee and the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee issued reports both some time ago in which they came to exactly the same conclusion. Right. And we were told, well, that's that doesn't count. Let's wait and see what Robert Mueller has uh, in store for us. So should we see, and I'm always worried about things that are based on you know law enforcement, evidentiary, uh, especially as you start to get into international relations, how much of the report should be released? The president said, I have nothing to hide. Go ahead, release it. Mark Warner, I mean, it's one of the few things Mark Warner and the president seem to be agreed on is, you know, let's let it out. Should we see the whole thing? Are there things that we just shouldn't be accepting the... the you know, the idea that we should be able to see it from inside out? Uh, yeah, there are things that I don't think should be released. I mean, first of all, by law, um, the Justice Department can't re release any information or evidence in it that came out of a federal grand jury. Uh, mm -hmm. That's by law. It's a criminal violation, actually, of federal law to release grand jury material. Second, they've got to go through, remember, um, uh, part of the staff were intelligence analysts. So that indicates that there might be information in the report that could reveal our intelligence method. method. Oh, so anything like that yeah. needs to come out. The third thing that they ought to consider, and this is not so much law, but I think protocols, is that if there's any unproven accusations against individuals in that report, um, I don't think that should be released. Sure. The, the reason being that actually would violate the protocols mm -hmm. that the Justice Department has. But prosecutors, they don't, they don't come out and say, well, um, we are closing our investigation because there's no evidence, there's not enough evidence to prosecute uh, Jim Smith, but we think Jim Smith is a bad guy. Right. You know, they, they don't engage in those kind of derogatory accusations. In fact, that violates... Justice Department procedures, and that's one of the reasons James Comey was fired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because of his conversations of inside baseball, as it were. And I worry about that. If they release this, then I, I think what my friends in the media want, and I think the leftists that want to continue this narrative, will take upon any of the tracks that Mueller's investigation took and says, see, this is what they thought he did, or see, and, and it, the story goes back to being the accusation not the yeah. exoneration. I think if I'm following what you're saying. 
No, that's that's exactly right, and th- that's why prosecutors are not allowed to do that at the Justice Department because, look, if you're going to prosecute someone, that individual has the ability to rebut mm-hmm. what the accusations being made by the government of court of law in a report in which they say, well, we don't think there's enough evidence to prosecute you, but we think you did bad things. How how is someone supposed to rebut that? <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it's it's one of those great things that I think you know maybe. At the end of the day, we grow from this and we we learn from it. Uh, I don't know if it gets better before it gets worse. Hans von Spakovsky, one of the great legal minds, the senior fellow at the Edwin Meese Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. Can I can I put a button into the word collusion, though, Hans, for a second? Uh, because as far as I can tell, I was trying to find whether or not just the act of colluding with somebody is legal or Ill- illegal, or is it the outcome of what that collusive behavior is? Uh, obtained so i could it's the outcome right so i could collude with somebody to uh, prepare a radio show and there's nothing wrong with that but if i collude to price fix on an advertiser that's criminal no that that's exactly right um you know the the word more often used in legal terms than collusion is a conspiracy well Mm -hmm. look if if my wife and i engage in a conspiracy to um file our tax return completely accurately (laughs) We haven't right. we haven't broken the law. Yeah, I, that's what I just wanted that you know as a matter of record here. So uh, there's a, a and I know that election studies are one of your pigeons. I worry though that there's a non legal subtext to this that the narrative has been normalized over two years that we were fooled into voting certain ways. And now we add that to many of the Democratic Party candidates for president are talking about eliminating the Electoral College. And I put the two of those together in in a very concerning place because I think they they look at flyover country, quote unquote, and say, you you rubes, you were fooled into voting for Trump. You should turn your elections over to New York and Los Angeles and Chicago, where the smart elite people, you know, like Sinatra said, if you make it there, you can make it anywhere. These should be the people making these decisions because you were just fooled into voting for Trump uh, because of the Russians. And, And I worry that you know, that's that's a part of this. Am, am I just paranoid after all these years, Hans, to worry about those two things being added together? I think they are trying to add them together. But, of course, they're not true. Um, look, part of part of what Mueller did, and this is summarized in, in Barr's report, is, yeah, they did indict um, Russian military officers for engaging in hacking. And what was the hacking? Well, they hacked the DNC computers and the Hillary Clinton um, uh, computer network, too. And then they turned that information over to WikiLeaks, which released it. But the the key thing, and, and nobody's justifying the hacking, that's highly illegal, but the key thing to keep in mind there is that um, there is no claim whatsoever that they made up that they made mm-hmm. up the communications that they released. All they did was take the internal communications of the DNC and the Clinton campaign and release them to the public. So the, what, what happened was voters got to see what was really going on inside the DNC and inside the Clinton campaign. There wasn't a pattern of misinformation um, uh, put out to try to fool people into thinking something that wasn't wasn't true. Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure, you know, we, we can't we can't approve that kind of hacking, but I don't think anybody can say that the Russians somehow fooled people 
into voting for Donald right. Trump. Well, and if you remember the story correctly, it isn't even something that they they were doing trolling just for you know a general phishing. Ex- uh, this was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, one of uh, Hillary's insiders, uh, and I can't remember yeah. which one clicked on a phishing scam. You know, you'd be amazed at what Alice from the Brady Bunch looks like now. Clicks on it, they get into his computer. They're like, "Holy cow, look at this!" or whatever the Russian phrase for "Holy cow, look at this" is, uh, and that's when they said, "I wonder if this is something people." should see no nobody in the whole narrative hans has ever denied what we saw in those right. emails and and i think that's also important as they try to dodge that under this idea of oh it was the russians it, you know obviously an investigation requires chain of evidence and you can prove and things like that but when nobody from debbie wasserman schultz on down has ever denied what was in those emails um i think it's important and and nobody ever tried to contextualize them saying oh you didn't know what we were talking about here's what we really meant when all that happened they were they were colluding to keep burning Sanders from getting the nomination. Why isn't he more upset about this? Well, I I don't know. It, it I guess maybe he doesn't want to say anything because uh, he doesn't want to say anything that upsets the general liberal narrative uh, on this. Mm-hmm. But uh, look, the second part of the report, which we ought to just quickly mention, was on the obstruction of justice charge. Yeah. And, and again, uh, uh, Bill Barr, the uh, William Barr, the uh, Attorney General concludes there wasn't evidence of obstruction of justice. And that's a key issue. And the the common sense way of thinking about this for anybody listening to your show is it's pretty difficult to charge somebody with obstruction of justice when there was no underlying crime to obstruct. And if there was no collusion, then what the heck could you be obstructing? <laughs> that's a great point uh, there. Uh, and, and now what about some of the, you know, the president's folks like Cohen and and his testimonies and uh, everyone said, ah, you see, Cohen, the rat is going to spill the beans and we're going to find out, you know, that the president did all this stuff. Uh, I didn't. It's all kind of come and gone. And now there's nothing there. Uh, and yet people are in jail like Kelly. Uh, what what happens to them? Well, remember, they they were they they've all been put in jail for things that had nothing to do with the campaign. I mean, Michael Flynn is in jail because he engaged in tax evasion, bank fraud, and things like that. Uh, Paul Manafort's in jail because he also engaged in tax evasion and other things uh, years before Mm -hmm. he got involved in the campaign. So, you know, this finding isn't going to overturn any of that. It's just there aren't going to be any indictments of anyone for collusion because it didn't happen. From a legal standing, and I forget who wrote the book, but there's a book out there, I think it's titled like 11 Felonies a Day, uh, that if somebody wanted to, they could charge each and every one of us, Hans, with with crimes if they wanted us to go along with things. Is this a serious issue that you know maybe nobody realizes, but when we look at the process crimes, we look at civil asset forfeiture here in Virginia and things like that, I, I think our liberties have been lost in the middle of the night when these laws are passed that give you know, people the opportunity to say, oh, well, you were you were on that property, that's trespass, and all of a sudden you're guilty of a felony unless you testify under oath the way they want you to. Well, yeah, there are way too many uh, federal laws these days making all kinds of things crimes that shouldn't be crimes, uh, that should maybe at the most be a civil penalty, even, even if that. And that is that is a comprehensive problem under both federal and state law all over the country. Is that something anyone's even talking about doing anything about or maybe can be a fruit of this? I mean, besides you and me. Uh, well, yeah, you know, Heritage has been pushing on this uh, for years. And one of the things we've been saying is that uh, there's been all kinds of federal laws passed that make things a crime just based on committing the act without even any intentional and knowing conduct. And nothing should be a crime without requiring that you intentionally knew that what you were doing was wrong. I like that uh, angle on it. Hans von Spakovsky from the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at Heritage, uh, heritage heritage.org. And you can read his stuff there uh, about collusion and so much more than that. Thank you so much for joining us this week on Freedom and Prosperity Radio. Sure thing, anytime.
CPAC 2019, the highlight of this CPAC was a screening of the movie Unplanned. It's the story of Abby Johnson, uh, and Abby Johnson is sitting next to me here uh, on Radio Row. First, I, you know, having never had it done to me, I have to ask the more shallow question. What is it like to see your life turned into a film? Yeah, it's just a very strange experience. Uh, very, um, you know, it's a very vulnerable uh, feeling, just knowing that millions of people potentially are going to, you know, see truly the worst version of, of me. That's why I, 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 at a point, and then you've, you've come to where you are here. Uh, for those who don't know the story of Unplanned, it starts with Abby, who was one of the youngest directors uh, for Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I worked there for eight years uh, as clinic director with the Houston affiliate and left in 2009 after witnessing a live ultrasound guided abortion procedure where I saw a 13 week old unborn baby fight and struggle for his life against the abortion instruments. And I knew then that I had to make a change. So I decided to leave my job and I've just been speaking out and, and talking about abortion, really trying to just shine the light on this darkness that's happening that's really very pervasive in our country. You don't remember this, but this is actually not the first time you and I have been in the same place. You were in Charlottesville speaking for the Pregnancy Center of Central Virginia at their annual banquet several years ago. And I remember how being struck by how powerful your story was then. Um, what was it, I mean, aside from what I get and what I think everyone in this conference gets that would make somebody say, hey, this needs to be turned into a movie. People need to see this. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I think, you know, I think people like a, a good uh, sort of redemption story, a good conversion story. Um, and this is, you know, this is definitely one of those types of stories. It's, And I, I feel like in our society now, people are really searching for truth, particularly about this topic. I mean, look at what's happening in our in our country today with these late term abortion bills and you well, know. my own governor yeah exactly he's a pediatrician by yes, the way yes yes and so i think you know our country is really primed and ready for a film like this uh, we were talking with ann McElhaney, who is the investigative journalist that unearthed kermit gosnell's uh, abortion house of horrors as well and we were talking about a uh, knights of columbus survey a poll that was done yeah that shows a 16 percentage point change in the number of people that self-identify as pro-life from pro-choice. Uh, and I think it's a lot of this message making people realize, oh, that's not what I thought was going on. Yeah, I think the Democrats have really overplayed their hand. So I think they have swung the pendulum so far to the left that they are really now out of touch with even their pro-choice constituency because most people who identify as pro-choice will say, oh, there's a line in the sand, right? Viability is my line in the sand. That was my line in the sand when I worked at Planned Parenthood. Um, and, and so I think they've gone so far now that they've just, they've forced people to look at the issue in a way that maybe they haven't looked at it before. So you were a rising star with Planned Parenthood. Um, and the story is, you know, and then you saw what was going on. Was it a slow process after that, or was it like a light switch being turned on for those who haven't heard the story? And I don't want to give away the whole movie uh, either. Uh, I know there's a car chase or something in there, I hope. But, yeah. uh, but, but it, you know, really, you know, I, in Virginia, bless their hearts, we tried desperately to pass a sonogram bill that would, that would make sure that anyone seeking an abortion would see a sonogram, just from a medical standpoint. But snatching defeat from the jaws of victory, even the Republicans inser inserted, and I use that word intentionally, some sort of you know proviso that required penetration radar or something like that, that made it unpalatable for even the hardcore conservatives to stand with. Um, but, but I think just being able to see the simple sonogram that you know any pregnant mother sees, it, it, even if it changes half of the hearts, 
that's such a big change. Yeah, and we know the power of ultrasound technology because we see it in the Pregnancy Resource Center movement across the country. So the statistic is that at least 85% of women will change their mind if they can see their baby on an ultrasound. There's power in that medical technology that we have available to us and the fact that Planned Parenthood and, and other organizations like them want to conceal that from a woman shows their true intention. It shows that they're not really pro-choice. They are really pro-abortion. So, yeah, I want to go on to a tangent a little bit with you and talk about your experience as a, a, a director for the Houston area Planned Parenthood. How much of what we saw in uh, Project Veritas's hidden camera videos was commonplace, or did you see anything like that kind of stuff where it's, okay, I can get you these parts, and, and there was a, a profit motive to what was going on in there? Yeah, I mean, our affiliate was part of, part of that program, um, but it, it wasn't anything that was hidden or secret, really. I mean, we were really proud of the program. We felt like it was uh, really altruistic in a way, you know. Um, we were like, oh, well, we can help end all of these other terrible diseases by using these babies and embryonic stem cells. So it was like you could turn something bad into something really good. And that was how we sold it to patients as we were trying to convince them to give us consent to use um, their aborted babies. But we also gave them $50 off their abortion procedure if they did it. So that was usually enough. So, Abby Johnson, the, uh, the subject of unplanned, uh, controversial because they gave it an R rating. But the R rating comes from a seminal part of the story, which is seeing the ultrasound happen. Um, it's a shame that the movie ratings industry has done that. But I think some movies would you know, say that maybe that gets more attention for you. It's actually been really a blessing in disguise because we, uh, we didn't really expect it. And then when it happened, the irony was not lost on the media, right? So... Now, a 15-year-old girl can't go and watch a movie about abortion without her parents' consent, but she can go into an abortion clinic and have an abortion without her parents' consent. So, you know, I think that it, the irony was not lost, and it ended up, I think, energizing people um, within our own base to say, no, I am going to go see this film and I am going to take my kids because they need to see this truth. I, I actually had a friend who suggested they would they would volunteer to take the neighborhood kids with them if there, <laughs> there wasn't enough time. Uh, Abby, you know, it, what is your hope for your message as it goes forth out here and um, you know, I'm, I force myself, anytime I talk about abortion, I try to make it my life's mission to say the word adoption, even if I just say the word adoption, because my niece was an adopted baby of a 14-year-old unplanned, 14-year-old girl's unplanned pregnancy, and she's amazing. Uh, and I can only think what a loss it would have been for the world if she hadn't been born. Uh, is that the message is, you know, have the baby, let somebody else, if you can't do it, you know, somebody else can help raise it, adoption, do better planning. I mean, God bless, you know, the idea of planning for parenthood would be a great idea if only there was an organization dedicated to helping girls plan to be parents. Yeah, I think the overarching message here is, um, you know, there's not really a, a politically motivated agenda here with the film. I mean, we're really just trying to... It, and it shouldn't be political, no. should it? Yeah. No, it's just, this is just a human rights issue. Yep. This is a, one of, you know, this is, a, in my opinion, the greatest human rights tragedy we've ever seen in our country. And, uh, I, you know, I feel like we just have to show the truth. And people are not going to be able to go watch this film, walk away, and say... Well, I just didn't know what was happening. They will know at the end of this film. And I want people to really understand. I want them to walk away from this film understanding that no matter what they have done in their past, no matter what they have done in their life, redemption, forgiveness, conversion, that is available to all of us. And uh, that no one is too far gone for God's grace. 
Well, thank you for that message. And Abby, it's an honor to meet you again. Uh, and uh, you're welcome back in Charlottesville for the Pregnancy Center of Central Virginia's next banquet. I, I'm sure uh, it will be a standing room only crowd, but I really appreciated your story then. I appreciate it now. Uh, bless you for having faith in the people who made this into a movie because that's got to be nerve wracking as well. <laughs> a little bit, but they, they are very faithful Christian men and I just, you know, I trusted them from the very beginning. They told me that they were going to honor me and honor my story and, and they have done that. Well, thank you for joining us and honoring us with a little time, Abby, and thank you for doing this. Of course. Thank you. So in conclusion, without the benefit of a lot of media buys or things like that, let me give you a quick thumbnail sketch of where within the broadcast areas of this radio program you can see unplanned this weekend. In our flagship city of Charlottesville, the Regal Stonefield 14 on US 29 in the shops at Stonefield. In Lynchburg at the Regal River Ridge 14 on Candler's Mountain Road and in Roanoke, New place this week from last week, AMC Roanoke 10 on Electric Road. Uh, and certainly you heard the word Regal come up. Uh, many of the theaters showing unplanned are the Regal chain of cinemas. Uh, and in our flagship city, they also showed Gosnell as well as Dinesh D'Souza's Death of a Nation. Uh, if you're ever just wanting to see any movie, maybe you want to consider the ones that stand up for equal time for all. You can find these on the website unplannedtickets.com. Until next week, for all of us here at the Virginia Institute for Public Policy, so long and thanks for all the fish.